So hello and as always, welcome to the Tales Inspire podcast. I'm your host, Chris Patel, and I cannot wait for another inspiring tale from one of our ambassadors, Magnus Wood. Now, before we go into that, I want to remind you that we've got so much going on. Whether you're in schools, if you're at a corporate event or workplaces, you're looking for a speaker or you're looking for a workshop, we've got something for you. We've got our Schools to Inspire program and we've got so much going on. Individual online sessions and in person. We also have our Tales to Inspire book and our events that are online and in person as well. Just check out at www.talestoinspire.com. Now to today with Magnus Wood. Magnus shares his story and goes into kindness and why it's so important. His story goes through one of transformation, traveling from one place to a completely different and the corporate world that sits in between. I can't wait for you to listen and I hope you enjoy. Magnus Wood, welcome to the Tales to Inspire podcast, mate. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm very excited about this. So this is going to be great. Um, we've tried it a few times, whether it's internet struggles or whatever's gone on. Um, but today we finally cracked it. So Magnus, do you want to introduce yourself, who you are, where you're from, and, and we'll just take it from there, mate. Yeah, sure. So uh, so part of the reason we have internet uh, struggles is that uh, I'm on a boat. So I'm lucky enough to live and work on a boat, uh, a, a houseboat sort of for most of the week. Uh, you can't see it through. All that light is basically uh, the canal boats and things like that. We, we may see a boat go past, which is quite exciting. Um, so I am Magnus. I am a co-founder of the Kindness Corporation. And we are a business with a social mission to make work better for everyone. And it's, uh, as we'll talk about when we talk about my story, it's a passion project. It's something I feel absolutely convinced about is, is my mission and purpose in life is to make work better for everybody. So that, that's me and delighted to be here. Amazing. And so what intro, where does it all begin, Magnus? Let's go back to the very beginning. Let's go back to the start. Childhood, where did you grow up and, and what was that? <laughs> What was that like at the very beginning, mate? Do you have any dreams and what you wanted to be when you was older and, and, and what went on from there? Uh, I definitely did. I want to be an astronaut or something like that. I'm, I actually wanted to be in the army, which is kind of like the, the, the least least sort of likely job, I think, for me to be uh, in, in now, given the nature of uh, what I do. Uh, but I come from a, a, a sort of a military family. So uh, although you can't tell it, I'm Scottish. Uh, I was um, I've sort of born and brought up in a combination of, of the highlands of Scotland, the place near Glasgow and also in London as well. Um, and so I started my life uh, in Scotland as a wee Scottish laddie. And uh, that's that's where I lived until around about the, gosh, last year of um, junior school, came down to London and just fell in love with the place, completely different to where I'd been living previously, just big hustle, bustle, noise, you know, you name it, whatever. Um, it's a, a great place to, to live. And I was um, basically grew up in the 70s. I was lucky enough to uh, to go to a grammar school uh, when back in the days when when there were many more of them. And I guess at that point in life, you know, I started to learn lessons about you know learning and leadership and you know work, hard work, and kind of focus. Um, I was also um, I had the, the the gift. It was a, a strange gift of of actually being. Um, living quite a way away from the school. So uh, my teenage years, uh, and, I, and I've written about this, were, were actually spent a lot of time on my own, which was kind of like, um, I think a lot of teenage boys spend a lot of time on their own. Mine was somewhat enforced because my friends all lived quite a way away. But actually what that did was that that um, gave me a, a love of books and gave me a love of learning. It also enabled me to, uh, little known fact, be, become then, I'm probably not now, an expert on the Loch Ness Monster because I was absolutely fascinated with the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> so I can I can tell you all sorts of stuff about uh, trivia about the Loch Ness Monster. Um, and also I became really interested in, in nature, um, nearly studied zoology at university, but ended up doing psychology. But, you know, got a, a, a love of nature, used to um, forever be smuggling newts and frogs and things like that into my bedroom, which my father would then take out. So, uh, so probably somewhat of an eccentric um, child. Um, and then in my last couple of years of... Um, school we moved back to Scotland uh, to a place that was a bit unfamiliar to, to me uh, and I finished my last couple of years of school there uh, actually I, I went to a an, an all boys school so that, like, literally my last two years of school was was there were girls there like these completely unknown species you know you can smoke well not not that I'd ever been in a position to be able to smuggle one of those into my bedroom but completely <laughs> uh, species of, uh, uh, to, to me so um 
so that was my sort of somewhat eccentric uh, um, sort of, and you know, at times lonely, but also gave me a lot of fortitude as well as, a, as an individual uh, growing up. Um, I then went to read psychology at Southampton University because I've, you know, I've always been interested in people, kind of what makes them work, why do they, why do they tick, why do they do the things they do, and I had a great time. I, I um. I really enjoyed a lot of my course uh, and, and really, you know, playing, you know, it's like we play tricks on people. We're doing like experiments with the, with the kind of like people in, in the, in the common rooms and things like that. And they didn't really know about it. So we were doing all that sort of stuff. Um, and then, uh, so then it got to the point of kind of what am I going to do to make a living? And I decided to go into advertising because I wanted to do something creative, um, but uh, and I want to do something in business. And and at that time, and this we're talking about the eighties here. I'm that old, so this is the eighties. I became a yuppie in advertising, and and absolutely loved it. I loved the creative process. I loved being in London. You know, I just loved um, sort of being involved in something that was great and making TV commercials, stuff like that. It was, it was great fun. Um, and I did that for quite a long time. And that, that was when I started to pick up lessons about how to work and I guess how not to, to work. Because one of the things about um, <clears throat> the advertising industry and this kind of media and marketing, things like that, they're not necessarily the, uh, the most... Um, the best working environment, shall we say. They're, they're often populated by people who uh, are big egos um, and particularly, you know, sort of uh, can, you know, sometimes the people who shout loudest get, go the furthest. And that's very much the case in kind of the advertising uh, world. And um, I still managed to, you know, to, to do well, I ended up running uh, a couple of agencies. Um, and so I spent a lot of my time in, in that world, you know, working in the UK and, and globally. Um, but over time, actually became sort of disillusioned with the idea of just selling stuff to people. Uh, also found that a lot of the time we'd be making presentations and advice to, to clients and things like that. And then they never end up doing what, what we what we were recommending, which after a while became uh, a little bit uh, sort of disheartening. But actually, as I grew and became a leader, the thing that that excited me most was actually running organizations and leading people. And actually that was the thing that, I, that sort of lit me up was, was creating the environment that, where people could do great work. Uh, and I realized uh, at that point that this was essentially my, my mission in, in life because I, I came to the conclusion, not quite sure when, but certainly by seeing the opposite of it, that I came to the conclusion that the role of a leader in an organization is to create the environment for people to thrive and do their best ever work. And in many senses, it's not much more complicated than that. But I saw plenty and plenty of examples of, you know, leaders who were do weren't doing that, were creating cultures where they were encouraging people to compete with each other, whose values weren't that brilliant, uh, and just generally just not being a good leader of, uh, of people. So, so I was, you know, very much this was my driving force. I was blessed in my last job. I mean, we're getting close to, to 2020. Uh, in my last job, I happened to be running a um, large content creation and production business and a branding company for a uh, large UK-based uh, e-commerce retailer who uh, haven't done so well uh, recently, uh, partly because of the, the way that they have run their, their organization. Um, and I was in this, this position of delivering lots of revenue, had a big team of people, uh, around about 200 people uh, spread across the UK. And, uh, uh, and, you know, I thought creating a great culture. But the values of this organization were here. My values were kind of way over there, the other end of my boat. Um, so I got to the place in 2019 where, where we parted ways, which was kind of relatively inevitable given kind of this clash of values. And I decided then that it was time to put sort of my money where my mouth was. I also decided I never wanted to work for anyone ever again uh, because I was just kind of fed up of being in this position of sort of wanting to do things and, and, and having a view of how, how to work well and create great work for people and having people get in the way uh, of that. So I, for 2019, I basically worked with people that I worked with in the past and, and helped them encourage, create good cultures, create good teams. You know, I kind of worked in this area of sort of teamwork and cultural development uh, and was in that space. 
And then just before lockdown, so all the way back, uh, I know we're all a bit hazy on the on, on the on the dates, but just before uh, around about February 2020, I had three of my clients all ask me around about the same time about how they could create kinder working environments. And this was just before lockdown and lockdown hit and kind of work fell off the cliff. And, you know, we we all know what happened. We all kind of retreated into our homes. Um, And I was supporting some people. Um, This is when I kind of got onto Zoom and when video started to become a big thing in our lives. I was supporting some people going through the lockdown, just generally helping them uh, and and kind of, you know, because it was a tough time for us all. But I thought, you know, this kindness thing, that there's something in this. This is kind of like chiming with, with who I I am and, and what I believe. Um, so I started to look into all the research papers I could find, uh, you know, every book, everything I could find on kindness in general, but also kindness uh, at work. Uh, and, and I found a couple of things, first of which is there wasn't much written about kindness at work. Uh, and the second thing that I found was that whenever I read anything about kindness at work and you kept coming across the same studies and the stuff. So that's why I know I did the largest meta-analysis, which is an analysis of analysis of, of other people's work. I did the largest meta-analysis on kindness in the workplace. And, and everything I, I found pointed to the fact that when organizations are deliberate about creating kinder working environments, creating kinder cultures, all the all the positive stuff you want to see go up goes up like innovation trust creativity teamwork well-being you know all of those positive things you know sort of increase within within organizations and the negative things like you know mental poor mental health poor physical health you know sort of conflict toxic working environments they all they were all going down now this was kind of suggestive of the you know the evidence that i found um so i wrote a book I wrote a book called The Kindness Code, which uh, I published uh, sort of, gosh, about, over about 18, uh, 18 months ago now, where really I pulled together um, all of the research that I could find at that time. But also I told the story. I told the story in this book. It's a, it's a combination of kind of fiction and, and, and a collection of facts and, and insights. And I told the story of a relationship between two people that unfolds over time and, and how kindness really is pivotal pivotal to them working better together and the book ends with uh with seven steps that anyone can take to to create a kinder working environment um i'll carry on there's a bit more to the story yet um and so i started off thinking right kindness let's let's go down that road and as as you know we went in and out of lockdown i started talking to more and more people about kindness at work and discovered as you, as you know, Chris, that kindness is like a magnet. You know, people are drawn drawn to it, and they, you know, that it's one of those things that flushes out and attracts the good people. So I found myself having conversations with all sorts of folk uh, from all different kinds of organisation about creating kinder working environments, uh, and I started helping them. I started doing workshops, you know, seminars, talking to them, you know, giving advice on how to really increase kindness within the organisation. Then uh, I got involved with KindFest, which was an amazing uh, initiative, which has been running now for two years. Uh, they, they first started on World Kindness Day, November 13th, 2020. Uh, I curated and, and hosted the Kindness at Work sort of content stream. It was five hours of people talking about kindness. It was a wonderful experience and connected with me with some, some marvellous people. Uh, and around that time, I met the co-founder of the Kindness Corporation, a lady by the name of Cole Baker Bagwell, who had been doing the same work as me. And this is the amazing stuff. She'd been like working in the States and Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, had on her website was saying that she was helping support a kindness revolution in business. And in normal circumstances, we would have been, you know, competitors or something like that. But we, we weren't because because we have a kind approach to working. We we talked together. We sort of like we spent most of last year kind of working out what we're about. And then on November the 11th uh, last year, we opened the doors of the Kindness Corporation. We closed down our own businesses and we have set ourselves up to to, to go out there and make work better for everybody. I'm going to pause now because I need a, I need a drink. And also, you haven't said anything for about 10 minutes. <laughs> I've just been listening, mate. Amazing. What a journey. And there's so much I want to delve into as well, Magnus, to be honest. But um, first of all, congrats. Congratulations. Like, to go through the corporate world mm-hmm. and to see 
the reality of the situation and where you're at and then to come out of the corporate world that takes a lot of courage um mm. i mean oh, i've got a few questions you know i want to delve into them I could not oh. do it if you see what i mean it's one of yeah. those things that i yeah it, you get to that point where it's just like it would be ridiculous to 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 have another job it, you you just you know not that i'm unemployed like probably am unemployable but 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 it's sort of like you know something becomes so big in your life and you become so convinced that that this is a wonderful thing that, that that actually you can create a big impact on people then you know as, as everyone in this situation says you've just got to do it because if you don't do it it'll just keep knocking on your head and and you'll either end up bitter you know because you didn't do it or you'll end up happy because you've you finally listened exactly and, and that's where it comes because i think you talked about like your values and the company that you was working at's values and how they mm. were so far off Mm. I come across so many people who are trying to fit their values into the yeah. company that they know that they don't agree with. And um, yeah. so they're kind of like sacrificing themselves and they'll say, it's okay. Yeah. Well, it's all, I'm earning money. Mm. But the people who created nuclear weapons, and this is something that I heard recently. Um, they're one of the clever, some of the cleverest people you'll ever meet. But what did they say? It's okay. I'm supporting my family with the paycheck that we're getting. <laughs> yeah. So it's, exactly the same like exactly mm. the same but where are mm. your values and how important are they to you mm. um and i think that's so important do you do you think that you learn your values from your family background was it your schooling and the fact that you traveled from different places like where did this because many people would just say hey, get, show me the money i mean you you led 200 people in a huge company like where are your values coming from i think I think I've always had the courage to stand up, stand alone and stand for what I believe in. And I think that's something that absolutely came from my background because, because I was, uh, grew up and, and actually spent a lot of time on, on my own sort of, you know, kind of because of the circumstances and that, that made me feel very comfortable, um, standing apart. And also because within with the time I was in London and Scotland, we actually moved around. So I actually went to, to quite a lot of schools. Um, so I was, I was forever having to move into somewhere new and, the, and you've got a choice then you can either absolutely fit in and subsume yourself to get everything that's going on, or you can get, you can say, look, this is who I am and I'm comfortable with the fact that, you know, I don't get on with these people or, or, or whatever, which that's a hard thing for anybody at any age. But I guess that muscle for me, um, you know, sort of got, got, you know, sort of worked on time and time again. And I, and I suppose, that made me happy to stand apart. Now, I've only recently, um, so you know, the, the the values of the Kindness Corporation are kindness, curiosity, and integrity. So kindness, curiosity, integrity. Uh, we've, you know, I've only recently really kind of adopted those as personal values as well. Because a lot of the time you don't really know what your values are. You never work them out, never quite get around to it. But I think it's been one of those things that's kind of evolved over time. And now I have them, and now Cole has them, and now we have them as a, as a corporation. Think about values. Values are... They're both a north star, something you should be aiming towards. So she's aiming to be kind, curious, and 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 have integrity all the time. But they're also they're like guardrails. They're kind of like they give you the where you are going to go and not going to go. And that's why you know any organisation, if they're not bringing their values to life, then 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 they, they will struggle. They will struggle because you know people within the organization have to believe in the values and have to support them and, and a lot of time values are just stuff on a wall or they're kind of a bit bland or, or whatever values are, are so important and it, i think where you just finished with that as well is there's stuff on a wall everything that yeah. we do here it all sounds great but it all is soaked in action it has mm. to be action-based right. What are you yeah. doing? I guess it's more of a question. What are you doing about it? Or what do you want to do as opposed to you must do this? Yeah, because yeah. we want people to do it in their own unique way. I've got a yeah. question about your psychology degree. So you did mm -hmm. your psychology degree. How did that affect you? And what, what kind of learnings did you get about the human mind and, and, and how we work and, and obviously how you kind of think today? Yeah, so I read psychology because I was interested in kind of what made 
people tick basically still am you know and that's kind of one of the things that that, that, that make me you are who i am one of the things i did i was very lucky in uh in the course that i studied i did a project uh God, i'm not quite sure why they allowed me to get to do it but basically i did a a study which was sadly it wasn't a actual fieldwork study but basically i studied behavior in Papua New Guinea. So I kind of like strayed into anthropology and I looked at, there There are two behaviors <clears throat> that tribes show to each other, one of which is called ceremonial warfare. So basically it's kind of like they're just, they're fighting all the time and it's kind of one of those things. And the other one is ceremonial exchange where whole villages just club together and they like give to the other village this kind of like, you know, a tractor and loads of sheep and stuff like that. And it's a kind of phenomenon and you know, I'm sure it's more places than Papua New Guinea. And I was really fascinated by why they were doing this behavior. What, 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 how did it serve the people within the tribes to, to fight each other in the first instance, but also then club together and a huge personal and kind of, you know, expense to the village, give tractors, sheep, cows and all the rest of it. And at its essence, it really was about definition of who we are, because the warfare was us versus them. The ceremonial exchange and gifting was also sort of us versus them in some way. But it was about this group of people helping to find themselves because they had a shared set of values, they had a shared purpose. They had they had others against whom they could also see that they, they, they weren't. Um, but the thing that I realized as I looked through all of this, because the other thing that I, met, I had done earlier in, in my second year is I'd, I'd studied football hooliganism. And that was one of the things that we looked at, which is kind of like, why, why do people behave the, the way they do? Why do they belong to a club and why do they fight each other? I mean, Oh my word, this is the same thing. Yeah, these people, you know, that literally thousands of miles apart, different cultures, different ways of, you know, of being in many ways were the same. And this was the, you know, it might not be the most blinding insight that came away from my psychology degree, but I, I sort of realized, you know, it doesn't matter who we are, where we are, how we're, we're, we're brought up. We all express ourselves. I mean, you know, we all want the same things and we all express ourselves in ways that may seem different to begin with. But actually, if you dig under it, you know, we're all looking to you know, belong in some way or maybe not belong. That could be our thing. We're all looking for a sense of identity for ourselves. We're all looking for a sense of identity as a, of a group of people. In one part of the world, that's expressed by giving people sheep. And the other part of the world, that's expressed by beating somebody up. But it's kind of like it's all the same thing. So this was a big insight for me about the sort of commonality of, of human experience and, and how we, we bring that to life. We um, often get told, and maybe I, I get told about it a lot as well with what we do at Tales Inspire, that um, you're trying to be you're trying to live a kinder world or you want people to be happy. Like the words that you're using, Chris, are very fluffy um mm -hmm. kind happiness it's not very corporate or it's not very tangible side of things like what what's your definition of kindness like what is kindness and, and how do you kind of break those boundaries and barriers to people kind of saying that actually it's just there's no meaning to it so I was uh, I was sat at dinner uh, the last week with, next to a finance director from a from a big company and was you know I was sort of talking about kindness and what I did, and and he said well so what's what's the ROI on kindness what's the return on investment on kindness and and I obviously got my soapbox and went off on one in terms of like you know if I'm having to convince you the ROI and the kindness you're never going to do it but but actually the thing that convinced him and this is a finance guy. He's all about the numbers. And I came out with the arguments about how kindness creates environments where people thrive, the, the, you know, people, less people leave, all that sort of stuff. I said, you know, it's really simple. Kindness is a, a really clear thing. Now, um, I've talked to literally thousands of people about, about kindness. This definition of kindness actually starts with yoga and starts with the first yoga sutra which uh is basically says and it's kind of the core principles of yoga and it is uh do no harm so it's the, our definition of kindness that, that cole and i have starts there but actually we then realize and i love the fact you just talked about action a minute or two ago because 
do no harm is is fine and that's a great way to live your life and it's no wonder it's a fundamental principle of, of yoga but it needs to be active it needs to be something that's out there in the world so at the kindness corporation and personal definition now of kindness that we came up with is that kindness is a commitment in thought word and action so thought word and action it's a commitment to leave everyone and everything better so that's to leave everyone and everything better so here i am sitting next to this finance director and i'm saying this is what kindness is it's a commitment to leave everyone and everything better and he goes sort of like that and i go okay let's think about a meeting let's think about some of the meetings that that we have where people turn up late they're on zoom or teams they're not putting the cameras on or you you can see them quite clearly typing away and you can hear the ping of their email and all the rest of it and the person running the meeting hasn't set an agenda there's a whole stack of people in that meeting who are not quite sure why they're there but it popped up in outlook or whatever so they accepted it and uh the meeting you know sort of people talk over each other it runs over time and it's not clear what you're doing at the end of it that is an unkind meeting if contrast that with you set up the meeting you set it up for 30 minutes clear expectations everyone knows what they're there to achieve everyone knows that they have a contribution to make everyone walks away at the end of that that meeting feeling that they've been heard they've been listened to and there is a clear action plan that comes out of that, that everyone needs to know what they're doing that is a kind meeting that is why kindness at work is not wishy-washy because actually if your definition of kindness is to leave everyone and everything better that moves things on that creates more trust between teams it does it has a whole stack of those things that are positive that actually means that kindness at work does deliver an roi it's just a very large roi because it impacts so much of what we we do at work but it is something that that does live in the corporate world and it's something that sometimes a lot we take for granted uh, and i'll tell you why i think it doesn't exist in the corporate world in, in a second or two but i think sometimes we take it for granted when you shine a spotlight or hold a mirror up to an organization to to show them how kind they are which is one of the things that we do people realize oh yeah we're not trusting each other as much as we should do that's not kind but it's also impacting the performance of our, our business absolutely it really is and and that's it trust if you don't yeah. trust the people that you work with or live with or your friends, I, I get it all the time when people say, oh, yeah, these are my friends. But, yeah, I, I kind of keep my distance. Well, yeah, are they your friend? Like, are you being kind? Have you told them why you keep distance their distance from mm -hmm. them? Like, there's so much distrust in the society that we live. It's as if mm -hmm. I'm asking you questions, Magnus, and you're kind of thinking, well, what's his intention behind <laughs> his questions? And, yeah, yeah. And, it's kind of like that. That's kind of how we live, especially in England. I, I I found it that when I lived in America, if I had a business idea, I wanted to do something, people would give me 20 reasons as to why I can achieve it. Yeah. In England, it's often they'll give me 20 reasons as to why I can't achieve it. Mm. Mm. Slight difference, but just a different perspective. Now, obviously, that's very generalistic, but yeah, yeah. just something that I, I took from it. Um, there are loads of things that I do want to go into. Um, the Kindness Corporation. Tell me more about the Kindness Corporation. How does it work? Like, who who are you supporting? How how do people get in touch? And how is it? How is it? How does it work? So, uh, okay, uh, get in touch. Uh, search the Kindness Corporation or search Magnus Wood. Very easy to find. That's uh, how, how you find us. Um, so we, if we go back to what, so why we do what we do is from our own research so we we have did a piece of research in november and we have practical experience working with organizations so we have the largest global data set on workplace kindness that exists in the world and and we absolutely know that that kindness has positive multiple impacts on on people and the organizations they work in we also know that lots of organizations aren't kind so We've talked to CEOs, 100% of CEOs we survey say that uh, business can be both kind and profitable. In our survey in the UK and the US, 84% um, of people said that they wanted to work for a kind organization, yet only 66% of people did. So th there is some there's some disconnects out there. So essentially we exist because we spend 92,000 hours of or thereabouts that's about 10 solid years of our working lives in work you know at zoom whatever it is 
And we know back in the day, Gallup uh, did a piece of research where they showed that basically something like 80% of people were either miserable or unhappy at work. We know from our own research that, that there are very high proportions of people who are unhappy in the work that they do, particularly if you look at millennials and uh, Gen Z coming through, um, that they what they see about work is it doesn't fit what their expectations are and what they're, what they're looking for. So people are, are unhappy at work. And work can and should be one of the places of the greatest personal expression, creative expression. It should give you joy and purpose. We know from our research that substantial numbers of people are ending their work day tired, stressed out and miserable and not looking forward to the next work day. So the, the, there's a real problem and particularly with uh, gone through the pan pandemic. You, know, you look at the great resignation, you know, people are burnt out, there are epidemic levels of loneliness, you know, people are, people are struggling at work. So that's why we exist. We exist to fix that problem. Uh, as I said, you know, our job is to, is to make work better for everybody. And we do this through kindness because we know intuitively we feel kindness is a good thing. We know from all the evidence that we, we got from our own research and from everything we've done that, that kindness works. So we work with all different kinds of organizations. We worked with the NHS, the Scottish government. We work with, you know, scrappy startups and we work both in the UK and in the US. Um, and we support these organizations to create kinder working environments. And essentially we do three things. Uh, we have something called the kindness index, which is uh, comes from the data that we pull together and is basically a benchmark of the lived experience that people have of kindness within their organizations. So, so we know we've got the baseline data that tells us in the UK and the US for, for the working population, their experience of kindness. We then have a set of uh, 20, 20 questions which are completely a different combination of the questions that people normally ask in engagement surveys and things like that. 20 questions that we ask of the people in the organization and they include things about how they feel about the leadership how leadership is is modeling and 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 living the values of the organization and essentially these questions they're a mirror that allow us to basically show to the organization how kind they are and how kind they are compared with the benchmark but also they bring out the, the the hot spot. So you know, I, I don't mind saying this: trust within the NHS. You know, it's a, it's a systemic problem because you've got layers of management, you've got people with different roles. You know, there are real issues that we keep finding time and time again. So what we do with organisations, with the leaders of those organisations, is we 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 share what what the problems are. Now. We then don't sit in that organization. We're not like a management consultancy where you know, suddenly there aren't 10 of us in there trying to change that organization because we can't do that. Kindness and change has to come directed from uh, the, the top. So kind leaders have to model kind behavior, but also they've got to make sure that they're lighting fires of, of kindness throughout the organization. They're creating kindness advocates throughout the organization. So we support organizations to do that. The next thing that we do is we we work with leaders and people throughout the organizations to increase their self-awareness because kindness really comes from, from awareness. It comes from awareness of how you are being. So one of the things I say to people is, are you being kind to yourself? You know, you're spending the whole day in Zoom and team calls and not giving yourself any breaks like I do too often. Um, so kindness comes from awareness of self. It also comes from awareness of how you're showing up and how you're impacting others and how others are impacting you. But also systemic awareness as well. You know, how it comes an awareness of the, the organization, the culture and, and the, you know, the vibe of the place that you're working in. So we work with leaders and you know managers throughout the organization basically coming from mindfulness uh, and coming from a sort of proven work that we've done in the corporate environment for the last two years we take people through uh, basically a program to help them become more mindful more aware of how, how they are but also give them tools and practices that are incredibly useful uh, for them to to be to be kind of model kind of behavior and just show up better at work 
And then the last thing that we do, uh, and we've got a first cohort going through at the moment, is that we will certify your organization as kind. Um, we, uh, we basically, because of the the data we have, um, uh, and because of you know looking into an organization, we can basically say yes, you are an organization that's committed to kind. And there's one last thing that we do, which uh, we are just um, announcing and, and launching at the moment, is behind the hashtag work kind with two Ks. So that's work kind with two Ks. We are creating uh, essentially a weekly global gathering of people online who are committed to working kind. And we are, we've taken the, the sort of more expensive kind of corporate course that uh, exists and we've turned that into something that is, uh, it's $200 in American money, so that's even less in, in UK money uh, for uh, essentially a year's worth of time you can spend with myself and Cole, time you can spend with, with other people and basically get behind this idea of, of working kind and, and get some insights, get spend some time with, with mindfulness and, and address challenges that people have and basically get a bit, a bit of recharge every um, every week where you can, you can basically go, all oh, right, I've connected with my buddies here. I've kind of like learned about their problems. I've heard some great stories about, about kindness at work and, you know, go out in the world and, and, and keep doing the same thing and check in the next week. So we're busy people and we've started all of this since November of uh, last year. So we've, we've covered a lot of ground. Mm. I think that is it, right? You're busy people and it's, you give an organization or a company a kind certification. However, I think kindness is not a destination that you ever get to. It's something you continue to do. It's a process that has to be continued. Well, well, yeah, we'll, we'll take it uh, away if they, if they, yeah. if they pay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love it. Yes, we'll take it away. Just put that whilst you hand the certificate over. But yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, who are you, Miss, Mr. and Mrs. New CEO? Are you kind? I'm not sure. <laughs> well, I love it. Honestly, what you're doing and what you represent, Magnus, is incredible. And just for all our listeners and people watching that, I will be putting in the show notes everything about the Kindness Corporation and Magnus so you can find out more. Um, about how to get involved or check them out so you, you'll be able to get all that information. Um, Magnus, I do have some quick fire questions though. Sure. Um, does that sound all right? Are you ready for a little yeah, bit of a quick yeah. fire? I was, so, gonna, I was gonna actually ask you a question. I'm gonna put you in the spot here, Chris. I was gonna say, so what does work kind mean to you? If I ask you that question, yeah, well, I, we, we ask that. I ask that question on a daily basis of everybody. I stop people in the street and go, what does work kind mean to you? I'm, I'm really interested what, what you're, spontaneous answer is working kind to me is igniting a spark within someone else and nice. that's that's it really is is seeing the potential and igniting a spark no matter who you come across and um, i think that's working truly kind it is yeah it's really doing that you know not speaking to magnus ward i'm speaking to the best version of you even <laughs> even if you don't believe it you know that's who i'm speaking to um and i think if we can enhance that and it's really hard like don't get me wrong, in the individual level, I can do it as a culture and to get that in a cultural perspective, especially if you're in a workplace or even in a family or a big family sometimes or a school, mm. it can be really difficult. I say difficult, it takes time sometimes and it takes mm. some drastic changes where to enhance that. But um, yeah, that's my definition anyway. Thanks for asking, right. mate. Um, but that's also why you do what you're doing right here now. Is yeah. that your 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 people's stories? You you know you're lighting them up, but you're also using people's stories to light fires and light other people up as well. It's wonderful. And I think that's that's the thing is that I may not connect to someone, uh, you may not connect, but we've got so many people's stories now, and we mm. share so many people's different experiences that we build bridges so that actually we've got people who've got lived experience and they live it. So it's, there's so many bridges. You said it. Like you went to Papua, Papua Hour, you studied Papua New Guinea and you studied the football hooligans and you realised mm. there, there was a lot of similarities. Yeah. But there are so many similarities between us and our stories and others. Um, mm. We just have to see them because otherwise mm. we'll, we'll, see, we'll only see the differences. Yeah. Um, and the differences are great, actually. They shouldn't separate us apart. They should actually bring us together and we can learn mm. from each other. Um, mm. But yeah, that's... Man, this is why the interview the interview is not the other way around. Otherwise, I would not stop, mate. <laughs> I wasn't stopping. <laughs> so, quick five questions. What's going to happen is I'm going to start a sentence. You're going to finish it. Right. And um, if we need to explain it, you're more than welcome to. But it is quick fire. So, 
You ready? So let's go with kindness is. Is the way that we'll end up saving the planet. Love it. What a great start. Oh man, I didn't expect that on the first one. Oh man, that's amazing. Okay. Traveling can. Can broaden your horizons as long as you keep your eyes open. Oh, I love that. Absolutely love it. A true leader. True leader brings out the best in people and knows that that's their job. Workplaces can be the source of the the most joy in life and most fulfillment in life if we all work together and work kind i love it you do really good at this and i promise everyone who's listening or watching i've not <laughs> sent these i've not sent these beforehand um two more life is about life is about leaving this place better when you leave than it was than before you came in mm, i love that and my last one of this is a little bit different if there was a government rule or a law and it was your law, Magnus, what would that rule be and, and why? That's a really good question. Uh, I think, you know what? I'm really drawn to say let's work four days a week. I, I'm surprised myself at that answer, but I think actually, I think that would have an enormously positive impact on people. So I think, yeah, let's pass that legislation right now. I like it. I, I wasn't actually expecting that either. Oh, that's really good. And actually, let's go to the final question. You just sparked something in me there. If you was to give your younger self a bit of advice, say your 20-year-old self or 25-year-old self, what would you say and why? I'd say two things. I'd say, funny, I was talking about this to my sister last night, who's slightly older than me. Um, life is fast. So make the most of absolutely every day. It's a lot faster than you think. And the other thing I would say is build strong connections with people throughout your life and make sure you keep those connections warm because, the you know, life is one minute you're up, one minute you're down, the same with the people you're with. But if you've got strong connections between people, then you have people who have your back and you have people whose back you also have as well. And it's a very powerful thing. I love it absolutely love it oh magnus i just want to acknowledge you and say thank you first of all before we get into our final two questions i want to say thank you for standing up for changing your life but for going against the grain not being a sheep and saying you know what i'm going to make a difference where a difference is needed um and for sharing your story and doing what you're doing i can't wait to see how this goes mate oh, <laughs> it's in there buzzing um so my final two questions we ask every tales inspire guest these two questions the first question, Magnus, is what is your definition of the word inspire? To light a fire in, in somebody so that they they want to do things and see, see, see things in different ways and want to do things that they hadn't wanted to do before. I love it. I love it. It's very similar to mine, I think. And then <laughs> my, my last one is if you were to live your greatest life and say you're in your hundreds or whatever and you're looking back on your life, You've really lived the life you want to live. What is the biggest impact and proudest moments that you want to have achieved during the lifetime? Well, my daughters, Alice and Olivia, say that that my dad lived an amazing life and made life more wonderful for lots, billions of people and, and the planet. And he was a role model for the way that we will live our life and, pa and pass that on to our children. Amazing. Magnus, thank you so much for being on the Tales to Inspire podcast. My pleasure. It was wonderful. You you are a fantastic host and and I you have brought out some some greatness in in me in terms of, you know, the stuff I've shared and I'm I'm going to walk away from this, you know, on cloud 9. I'm feeling very good. So thank you so much, Chris. You're more than welcome. How incredible is Magnus? For him to show that actually I am going to be different to the world that is presented in the workplace and to try and make a difference is huge. He soaks himself in action. He wants to make a difference. His values are so key and everything is based on trust. There is so much to take from this. It's not happiness at the expense of others. It's happiness alongside others. And Magnus represents that just as much as Tales to Inspire does as well. If you want to know more about Magnus, the Kindness Corporation, or anything else, 
let us know. Everything's in the show notes. Please do comment, review. Let us know what you think on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you listen to us on our YouTube channel and reach out and follow us on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Tales to Inspire. Thank you so much as always for supporting us and we can't wait to hear from you.